Hi, I'm Rachel Bonetti, a corporate trainer, podcast host, and the founder of the Elite EA Academy. I'm excited to share my thoughts on overcoming generational gaps in the workplace in this short video. And we're going to look at the characteristics of each generation and explore some practical ideas to find a way to bridge the gaps we might be experiencing. Now, this is a hot topic in workplaces for good reason. Currently, we have five generations in the world and in most workplaces, about four. That's a really big spread of ages, perspectives, beliefs, and values. And consider everything that's shifted in the world from 1925 to the current day, and all of the experiences and challenges that every generation has had to overcome, and how that's shaped how we all are and how we see and experience the world. When we think about it in those terms, it's really easy to imagine how understanding and valuing each other can become a little bit complex. So let's start at looking at what the different generations are, beginning with the silent generation, born in 1925 through to 45. They're said to be loyal but traditional. Stability was important to them, they conformed and they weren't inclined to rock the boats. Being different was not welcome as they were growing up in the world. The post-war world was all about finding order after chaos. So these were children who were raised to work hard and keep quiet, hence the name. And they'd experienced serious hardship, instability, loss, and a lot of really lean times. Their children are the baby boomers, born in 46 to 64, and they were part of the population boom post-World War II, where everything had been put on hold and was now starting to normalise. They're said to be really happy-go-lucky because there was a lot of optimism post-war and post-Great Depression, and they're said to be collaborative but maybe a bit resistant to change. They're the longest living generation so far, and women had to fight really hard for their rights in this generation. And diversity wasn't in the corporate language or even the world language back then. A lot of freedom that we can take for granted now was campaigned at grassroots level in their generation. A lot of migration happened across the world in this generation and studying was done the hard way. So through books alone and there were no mobile phones. So if you said you were going to be somewhere, you had to keep to your word. There was no freedom at work at all. And to have a voice, you had to be very senior in an organisation. Then came Generation X, which is actually my generation, 65 to 1980. And it's a generation that's said to be independent, but a little bit bleak, which is I don't know about that, but there are a lot of underground movements in this time where personal freedom to be authentic really bubbled through. And we saw that through music. So like the disco movement, grunge with Nirvana, and of course, punk music. There was a lot of bucking against the norm and constraints. It was the first generation as well where technology started to shift and the world began to shape around that. So home computers, video games, MTV went from radio to music videos, the internet arrived at work and at home, of course, email and mobile phones. And this generation is regarded to have been the first truly entrepreneurial one. So a lot of big technology um, companies were created by this generation. And that's believed to have been because there was this sense of individualism, the first truly individualistic generation. It was really important to this generation to break free of the mold. Then we have the millennials from 81 to 2000. Now they've got a reputation for being really driven, but entitled. Again, not very flattering labels. They care about values. They don't care about hierarchy. They're open to change, particularly around technology. And they're known for being very creative problem solvers in the workplace because they're the first generation that moved from conventional ways of working to really innovative. And perhaps that's because they've had to ride the waves of rapid tech developments. They're much more concerned with quality and output rather than hours, and they expect trust and they like to do things their way. And they crave connection with their superiors, but more as a mentoring kind of dynamic. And it's a generation that, according to consumer research by McKinsey, values luxury. Computers have always been part of their world, and they've grown up in a world perhaps where it's a little bit smaller and more connected than any previously through socials, online shopping and online communities and the like. And diversity has always been part of the conversation in their lifetime. 
Then we have Gen Z, 2001 to 2020. They're known as progressive but disloyal. Now, by disloyal, it doesn't mean as in disloyal people. It just means the way that they uh, move through the world as consumers and employees. They're happy to swap brands really quickly. They'll swap employers more frequently. They are absolute digital natives. They've grown up with phones and tablets, and they are the most online connected of all. And if you think about the world that they've been born into with climate change worries, economic unrest, of course, the pandemic, there's a lot of anxiety in this generation and they're reported to have the highest levels of mental health challenges. They're very happy to change jobs often to get the experiences they want and to be in the environments that feel genuinely supportive to them. And purpose, meaning, accountability, sustainability and diversity are really important to them as well. They're idealists that are pressing for social change. They want to belong in inclusive, supportive communities. And unlike the millennials, they're most likely to explurge on experiences, to have an experience of something rather than to own something. Now, these uh, descriptions are not exhaustive. I researched them a lot to pull um, this together. And if you do a quick Google or TikTok search, it'll show you how deeply ingrained preconceptions and harmful stereotypes are about generational differences. And everyone will feel it in a different way, depending where we are in the spectrum. And when we break down what's important to each generation, our differences are really stark. So when we value such vastly different things and we grew up in such different landscapes what can we do not to just coexist at work but to thrive together in a way that's respectful and inclusive and allows for multi-generational impact so what would change if we can focus on the best attributes of each generation and instead use that to our advantage at work and in life instead of thinking of an us versus them mentality which is actually feeding into those awful stereotypes So instead, focusing on collective genius. So what each of us has to offer as individuals and then how collectively that's a pathway to progress and being genuinely inclusive and finding ways to offer what each other need at work to thrive. So I think as a baseline, it's important to recognize and value that diversity of thinking and ideas is really important and it's needed if we want to have well-rounded teams because there's no doubt that the wisdom of years and experience combined with the freshness that can only come with those starting out in their journey can put us all in a powerful position. So as admin professionals, what can we do to role model what generational inclusivity looks like and how can we work with all of our colleagues and have greater influence and impact? Let's look at a few practical ways with the first being check our own mindset. What are our own biases, preconceptions? Where are we subconsciously feeding into negative stereotypes that we read about in the media and see on socials? Things like outdated, lazy, entitled, disloyal, really awful, unflattering labels. And it's really unfair to label anybody any of those things. So instead, how can we reframe and respect a point of view that can only come with youth? And can we reframe and respect a point of view that comes with the wisdom of age and recognize what the world was as each generation moved through the world because it's been far far than far from rather perfect for anybody. So recognizing the journey of each person and see them as that individuals. Secondly, check the diversity of our own network and who our go-to people are. Are we seeking a broad range of opinions, support and perspectives, or are we sitting with what's comfortable? So people who are like us, who think like us and who behave like us. If the answer is yes, it's going to keep us exactly where we are. If we want change, we need to open ourselves up further and make the effort to have relationships and rapport with all generations at work, because when we don't, we are creating missed opportunities. Talent comes in so many different packages. Third, be an advocate for fairness and help break down any age or generation related stigma. And I know through the work that I do in the admin community, this is a thing on both sides of the spectrum for the more mature people, right down to those who are starting out. So make sure a diversity of voices are heard in your workplace and consider working groups, special projects, and think about the ways that you can have a balance of view 
in each, meaning a diversity in generations, because there's a wisdom that comes from having lived experience, and that can be invaluable just as much as creative young thinking is equally invaluable. And as an admin professional, you're in a unique position to influence cultural shifts, especially if you have a trusted advisor relationship with your exec. You might be in a position where you could call out opportunities for diversity that create learning opportunities for everybody. For think about communication styles and rules of engagement. Because when we're committed to building genuine rapport, that means flexing our own style as admin professionals. So different generations prefer different ways of connecting. Really consider who prefers a phone call and who prefers a message. I know people who will always pick up the phone because it feels more efficient to them. And I know people who dread seeing phone numbers come up on their phone. They'd rather get an email or a message that allows them the reflective space to process it or because it allows it to deal with them in a moment that it suits them to work on it with their current workload. And of course, then there are people who like to have a thread of uh, commitments and a trail to refer back to as needed. And we also need to consider neurodivergencies. Not everyone can manage workflow that's coming at them from every angle. Maybe we can find ways to bring this into conversation when you're introduced to a new coworker. Something like, how do you prefer to be communicated with? And perhaps they share that they prefer instant messaging and that might not be your preference, but you can say, well, no problem. I'll try to message you more than calling, but from time to time, I will call you because I'd like to stay connected in person too. Then you have a mutual understanding. Like imagine... Well, in general, what would change in every organization if we could find ways to compromise with communication alone? And of course, boundaries. Recognize they're going to look different to everyone, understand what they are for everyone, and work to accommodate them where it is possible. And five, common ground. The fastest way to get along with anyone is to find your common ground first. What do you have in common? And the starting point might be your values, maybe your organization's values and mission. Can you connect through that? There's a good chance that if you're in the same organization, you're connected to the same things anyway. And in times of disconnect, get back to what you're working towards in a project, what success will look like to both of you. And lastly, connection. The lowest pressure and least weird way of getting to know others at work is to make a point of going to company events, social gatherings. Because in social settings, we have the chance to get to know each other differently. And it can take some of the pressure off finding ways to connect in a meaningful way around the office or in transactional working conversations. So to wrap up, the key really is a will to understand each other and be a little bit more flexible in the way that we approach our communications and our work and how we think about each other. And bridging the, the gap requires a lot of effort to check our own biases and our mindset and be open to the strengths that each generation has to offer and practice diversity and inclusion. Get to know your colleagues on a personal level as individuals not a generation, and be really interested in what's important to them and be flexible in your ways of working so that you can get the best from each other. And this initially does take a little bit more time, but it certainly is worth it. I really hope that this has inspired you to be a change maker in your workplace and to help you find ways to bridge those generation gaps that might be popping up so that everyone is set up for success and has the opportunity to create impact, be seen and be heard. Because really, isn't that what we all want when we go to work every day? Thanks for tuning in.